one get off you laugh hello all and welcome to the innovation space at the second international agrobiodiversity congress we are ecstatic to have you here today to take part in this Congress, a convening of experts, practitioners, and policymakers from across the globe to showcase scientific findings and innovative nature-based solutions using agrobiodiversity for the transformation and sustainability of food systems. The innovation space has been made possible thanks to the generous support of the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and in partnerships with the International Fund for Agricultural Development, Rockstart, TM, IIT, the Lexicon, IITA and brought to you by the Accelerate for Impact platform, the initiative that bridges science and entrepreneurship to scale existing research products, but also to stimulate and fund the most visionary teams, explore game-changing solutions, and take them to market at unprecedented speed and impact. We bring to you today the innovation space, comprised of the Agrobiodiversity Innovation Challenge, a pitch session with our 10 finalists, where our expert selection committee will examine each in a live Q&A session. While the committee deliberates, we'll move on to the Innovation Forum, where panelists and big names across research, venture, and corporate backgrounds will have the chance to discuss bold solutions for how to bring agri-food science-based technologies to scale. And following the forum, we will hear the closing remarks and announce awards. My name is Megan Steele. I work to support the Accelerate for Impact platform, and I will be your moderator for this fourth portion of this innovation space. Together, we hope these sessions will serve to foster an enabling environment for groundbreaking innovative solutions and offer you an opportunity to learn and connect. Thank you again, and let's get started. It will be a very enriching afternoon, so please engage and use the chat box to share ideas and connect with your fellow innovators. Please allow me to introduce our first esteemed speaker this afternoon. Andrew Jarvis is the Associate Director General of Research Strategy and Innovation at the Alliance of Biodiversity International and SEAT. Andrew has also been flagship leader on the CGIAR Research Program for Climate Change, Agriculture, and Food Security, and established the CGIAR platform on big data and agriculture. Thank you for joining us today, Andrew. Welcome. Thanks a lot, Megan, uh, for the introduction. It's ab an absolute pleasure to be uh, doing this little introduction here. This, uh, don't tell the other organizers of other sessions, but this has to be the best and the most interesting session of the whole Congress. You know, I think this is, this is really where the magic happens. And so, um, so I'm very proud to, 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 to be giving some introductory uh, remarks and just, just to say, I mean, the, we, we've been working on this Accelerate for Impact platform now for a number of years. And, um, you know, we see this as a fascinating space. This is where the magic really happens. Um, the Alliance for, CIA, um, uh, for um, Biodiversity International and SEAT is, is, is a knowledge center. It's a center that works on generation of knowledge of science, research, for development. And we see this innovation space as a critical area where we need to be working. And um, it's, it's, it's where, you know, for two reasons, we think that, you know, knowledge products and working with research and technical uh, issues, we can, we can help sustainable businesses and startups and get into this ecosystem of business to, um, to, to develop better products, better um, 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 go to market more, more impactfully but also ensure that they're delivering sustainable development goals. They're developing um, uh, um, business practices and, and products that are gonna spur on the many things that we're, that we're looking for. And in this case, looking at agrobiodiversity and, and, and taking advantage and maximizing the potential of biodiversity for um, conservation and use. So, so it's, it's, it's a fascinating space for us to be inputting kind of with our knowledge, but it's also a means for us to be scaling what we're doing. And so, um, the innovations and ideas and some of the, the knowledge that we generate, how can we, we, we be working in the innovation space so that they get scaled and they reach as many end beneficiaries as possible. So more farmers adopting, markets growing for products that are agrobiodiverse um, and sustainable. And so, so it's, it's, it's a fascinating space. We're super happy to be in it and super happy to be uh, helping convene this, um, uh, this uh, today's innovation forum. Um, you know, the, I've been involved in these innovation forums a couple, a few times now. I've been working in, um, in big data in agriculture and we developed an innovation challenge. And it's the absolute favorite thing that I, I, I did all year because it really is, it's magical what happens when you create these kinds of spaces, innovation challenges, and you bring 
actors around the table that don't necessarily talk uh, um, um, uh, under normal circumstances. It creates new conversations, which is absolutely critical. Um, it creates the, the concept of having a, a challenge creates also new ideas. It spurs on new ways of thinking. It spurs on um, uh, new thoughts and, um, you know, and, 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 it, and it values the power of an idea, which, which I think, you know, we all need to always remember that an idea is so powerful. And innovation um, processes like this and the Innovation Challenge and the Innovation Forum bring those great ideas to fruition. They, 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 they let them graduate from the brain into action. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's great to see. And so I can't wait to see some of these pitches and can't wait to see um, some of these great ideas, you know, and it, it's, um, it's always quite transformational. I think, you know, you see some of these, 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 these new conversations happening. And I think it has the potential to be truly uh, tra transformational. Um, just to um, uh, end the, the introduction, just, I mean, with, there's no way we can do this alone. Um, this has been very much um, a journey that, um, that we've done with many partners and many friends, many of which are on this call and participating, but others lis listening, I'm sure. Just to name, but a, a very few, um, we have uh, um, the, the work, thanks to IFAD, thanks to Rock, Rockstar, to Deep Science Ventures, to the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Italian, Italian Ministry of Agriculture, the Italian Institute of Technology. Great to see such, <laughs> such amazing leadership coming from Italy on this. We have the Gates Foundation, Seed Stars, Google, and the list goes on. And we have so many um, other partners that everybody who's participated and pitched in ideas um, also um, contributing. And so it's, it's, it's a huge endeavor made up of many partners coming around the table from different sides of the world. And, and that can only bode well for this being magical experience and, and as, as getting some great results as a, uh, as a, as a result. So uh, thanks a lot. And I wish you all the best as we go through these pitches. Can't wait to see them. Thank you, Andy, for those kind words and, and that important perspective. Uh, we have next uh, to contribute to the opening remarks, one of those uh, mentioned uh, partners. Our next speaker is uh, Graciela Romito, is the Director of International Relations and Chair of the Agriculture Deputies of the G20 at the Ministry of Agricultural, Food and Forestry Policies of Italy. Welcome, Graciela. Thank you and good, good afternoon, everybody. It is my pleasure to participate uh, in the second Congress, uh, International Agrobiodiversity Biodiversity Congress, uh, and to speak uh, in this introduct in introduction uh, to the innovation space. I would like to congratulate uh, with the CGR, the Alliance of Biodiversity International and SIAT for the organization of this Congress uh, um, on uh, such a complex uh, issue in a very comprehensive uh, way. And I also would like to um, express my appreciation for the Accelerate for Impact platform, the venture-focused uh, um, research for development initiative designed to bridge science and entrepreneurship. I believe today's discussion can contribute to the next step of this platform. I'm firmly convinced that the Congress is an important opportunity uh, to deepen the knowledge on agrobiodiversity and uh, the awareness on the role of agriculture. We know that uh, in the last 50 years, unfortunately, we have registered a global de decrease on animal and plant uh, diversity. And uh, we know that uh, agricultural production has an impact on environment and on agrobiodiversity. So we need to work with farmers to make them able to contribute positively to the conservation, preservation and restoration of biodiversity and to make our agriculture always part of the solution. I'm optimistic. We are witness of a new era. In Italy, for example, there is a huge interest and commitment of the farmers to recover ancient seeds originate, originating from the Italian territory. This year, I had the opportunity to discuss with several Italian young farmers 
who are interested in finding new solutions to increase productivity, employment, value addition in agricultural systems, and they have a clear understanding of the role of science and technology in sustainable agriculture. For many Italian farmers, combining tradition and innovation seems to be one of the keys to increase productivity and value addition in agri-food systems. And talking about tradition means talking about local plants and animal heritage that can be pre preserved thanks to innovation. The combination of tradition and innovation could be the basis for a sustainable transformation of food systems. And the need to promote innovation in agriculture is also a general message of the G20 minister, ministers of agriculture communique. During all the G20 meetings, innovation has been at the core of the discussion and the G20 agricultural chief scientists stress the importance of science and evidence-based solution and convene that the complex challenges that the world faces require global commitment and international cooperation. Going to the interlinkages between agriculture and climate change, the G20 ministers jointly recognize the need for a strong political commitment, investment in research, and the importance of transferring the result to the farmers. We know that the agricultural activity is often exposed to climate, disease, and other natural risks. And sustained diversity and crop diversification is a way to make agriculture more resilient. At the same time, governments have the fundamental task to sustain diversity at different levels, since agrobiodiversity is one of its components and the diversity of territory needs to be preserved as a whole, considering people, culture, tradition, natural heritage and history. In this path, innovation can be a valuable ally of biodiversity. I wish you a fruitful discussion and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Graziella. To round up this opening session of the innovation space, we are lucky to also be joined by Taraya Tariki, the, the Director of the Sustainable Production, Markets and Institutions Division at the International Fund for Agricultural Development. She also oversees IFAD's recently created private sector unit in charge of non-sovereign private sector operations and initiatives. Thank you for joining us, Soraya. Thank you very much, uh, Megan. And it's uh, my pleasure to join Andy and Graciela and welcome you to the best session of this uh, 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 Congress. Uh, so uh, just to be a little bit more serious, uh, I would like to start by uh, expressing my words of appreciation to the Alliance of Biodiversity International and CIAT, CGIR, and the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation for convening this second International Agro uh, Biodiversity Congress. Further thanks should also go to the key partners and to recognize the valuable contributions of the fellow Rome-based uh, United Nations uh, sister agencies and all the innovators, the scientists, the entrepreneurs who will be joining and making this Congress uh, a, a real a success. As it will be emphasized later, uh, throughout the Congress, agrobiodiversity is and will continue to be the bedrock of resilient, sustainable, and nutritious food systems. The increased use of biodiversity in food systems will be essential to address some of the world's most pressing problems, such as hunger, climate change, and degradation of natural ecosystems. And I think COP26, which just ended, was a very good reminder to the world that action is needed now. The impact of the pandemic on socioeconomic growth, nutrition security and resilience have been underscored in many forms. We therefore need to recognize that we will still have to do a lot of work to ensure that through our collaboration and partnerships, creating opportunity and scaling up of science-based innovations to strengthen biodiversity systems and build resilience is critical. It's actually very important to leverage the recently launched Alliance CGIR initiative, Accelerate for Impact platform, which fosters partnerships with research for development organizations 
and collaborations between scientists and science-driven companies in order to harness the power of innovation and entrepreneurialism to effect radical change through the application of knowledge and solutions that will completely disrupt agriculture, food, land, and water systems. As IFAD, we align fully with the innovation space program's aims, where research development, business models promoting digital technologies and evidence-based evidence serve as, a critical, as a critical enablers for scaling up agriculture and food system transformation. We're therefore delighted to embark on this journey alongside our partners, namely the Lions, CGIL, and the other partners who are joining us today. Throughout the day, we will see a variety of creative ideas to promote scalable food systems. These innovations will include digital solutions, harnessing with data and combining older and newer technologies to support smallholders and rural communities. To scale, these innovations need a steady stream of investments, capital, and platform for sharing lessons learned and knowledge. We will also need to foster an entrepreneurial mindset and market-oriented culture and identify new talents with innovative solutions to address national agrobiodiversity concerns. What will be equally critical is avoiding fragmented approaches to solution development, but rather focus on ecosystem strengthening where different actors leverage on each other's strength, work, resources, learning for effective deployment and scaling up. EFA through the Agrobiodiversity Innovation Challenge has completed efforts through funding, technical assistance, professional coaching, and scholarship. This would not have been possible without the great support of the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and other partners, notably Siham Bari, the Instituto Italiano di Tecnologia, International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, BIP, Rockstar, and the Lexica. The challenge was aimed at identifying innovators who could have an advanced research by sharing ideas and solutions, as well as attract support innovators to scale up their solution through a long-term research and development collaboration with CGIL. Today, IFAD will present cash prizes of $5,000 each to the winners of the Agrobiodiversity Innovation Challenge. Through IFAD's rural development approach and our new ICT for development strategy, we remain committed to leverage innovative digital solutions that enable scalable adaption and promotion of sustainable agriculture thereby contributing towards the achievement of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. I therefore to look forward to an exciting day to learn, hear more about uh, from our innovators, from our partners, and see how can, together we can make a difference to promote uh, and revolutionize the food systems. Thank you, over to you. Thank you, Saraya, and thank you to all of our opening speakers. Once again, welcome all to the innovation space. We will now begin the Agrobiodiversity Innovation Challenge. First session, the Agrobiodiversity Innovation Challenge is a pitch competition for disruptive innovations that are helping to use, conserve, and consume agrobiodiversity in ways that are better for people and for the planet. We've received 336 applications from 76 countries with the ambition to contribute to transform food systems through the use and conservation of agrobiodiversity. In our call for solutions, we targeted innovations like technologies, methodologies, or practices that could show a proof of concept or minimum viable product that could be made available to farmers, consumers, and food companies to increase production effectiveness, competitiveness, and resilience. 
our call for applications sought solutions that enable the use of agrobiodiversity for healthy and sustainable diets, climate change adaptation and mitigation, and empowerment of small scale women and youth producers. Solutions like these are ever more important as challenges related to agriculture and food security, climate change, health and development become more pressing in coming years. The risks are tangible and to address these challenges while simultaneously improving the livelihoods of vulnerable communities and generating new economic opportunities, we will have to accelerate the process of co-designing evidence-based solutions that can significantly and sustainably transform food, land and water systems globally. Our partners recognize this and are invaluable in helping us to platform and highlight the solutions like those offered by our finalists today. Our partners are represented in the Innovation Challenge as members of the Selection Committee. Joining us on the committee today, we have seven distinguished judges. Jacob Van Etten, Principal Scientist and Director of the Digital Inclusion Research Program at the Alliance of Biodiversity International and SEAT, CGIAR. Gladys Morales, Senior Innovation Advisor in the Office of the President and Vice President at the International Fund for Agricultural Development. Matthias Brent Lorenz, Investment Manager of AgriFood at Rockstart. Damiano Petruzzella, Scientific Administrator at the International Center for Advanced Mediterranean Agronomic Studies, FARI. Samuele Morales, Innovative Project and Technology Transfer at the Italian Institute of Technology. Frederick Schwerz, Chief Executive Officer of the Business Incubation Platform at the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture. And Alberto Nisi, Co-Director of the Reawakened Food Initiative at the Lexicon. Across their organizations, our partners are offering our finalists cash prizes, mentoring and training, partnerships, scientific and technology guidance, or tuition for a master's program. All of the 10 finalists will have their chance to pitch to our committee and to all of you in the audience their innovative solutions. Each team has prepared a three minute pitch video. Following this, a team representative will have five minutes to answer questions from a few of our committee members. With great excitement, here is our first pitch from C Solution. Let us take you for the next two to three minutes to the Dominican Republic. Picture this, you're sitting here at the beach, eyes to the ocean, and you close your eyes. What do you hear? Most probably you hear the sounds of the waves, then you breathe in. What do you smell? You smell the salt of the ocean, and maybe you smell then the rum and the coconut milk in your drink. But there's something else, smell again. It smells like rotten eggs, and those rotten eggs, it's not because of some eggs laying around the beach, but it's because of this. The sargasm algae, a big problem in the Dominican Republic and the Caribbean, leading among other things to dead zones in the shores, causing fishermen to suffer due to the less fish and more difficult fishing conditions, and the tourism industry is struggling with declining number of reservations. And this is our solution, are by stimulant that improves nutrient uptake of the plants, protects them from drought and frost, increases the yield and the protein content as well. On our first trail, you can already see that our by stimulant increases the growth of the plant by over 40%. And in order to make this possible, we need to first rely on our supply in the Dominican Republic by the fishermen and as well as carbon, then we move into the production of the Targasm liquid extract, and finally to our final customer, which are the farmers in the DR. And there are a lot of farmers in the Dominican Republic and thus potential customers. 50% of the land is used for agriculture and over 1 million people work in this industry. But most importantly, 85% of them are small farmers, which is our target group. Since many of these farmers don't use fertilizers at the moment, as Paola from a local foundation stresses. We can serve these customers with a truly local product. Moreover, the population is increasingly aware of these algae problems and we tackle them by creating an organic and affordable product. This makes our solution unique and appealing for the farmers. Further, Biostimland itself is quite an innovative solution and we don't have any direct competitors in the Dominican Republic. Lastly, our production process is highly scalable, which allows us to create positive impact quickly. So to push this project forward, we need your help. This competition is a great opportunity for us to win CGIR as a partner for funding and research. 
Furthermore, we are looking for 15,000 euros in funding to expand our pilot phase. And the prize money is already a substantial amount of this, which would be a great help for the project. In Q1 of 2022, we plan to conclude our pilot phase and in Q2 already to uh, ramp up our production facility. In 2023, we want to focus on the scaling of our operations to increase the use of seaweed for sustainable growth. Thank you very much. We are looking forward to your questions. Welcome to the team representative from Sea Sway Lucian, project lead, Konstantin Weberfeld. Representing the committee to ask questions about this innovation will be Frederick Schwerz and Alberto Mitzi. To start, let's go to Frederick for our first question. Good afternoon. My name is Frederik Schreurs. I'm the CEO of the Business Incubation Platform. And while I have the honor to uh, speak with you, I have to admit that I'm sitting in the middle of the Central Africa in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I'm looking forward to see interesting challenges, innovations coming forward today and support you uh, with the It looks like there's a bad internet. Maybe Megan, while we're waiting for <laughs> Frederick to recover the connection, I can uh, I can go in my question. Sure, so, absolutely. Okay, for you. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm Alberto from the Lexicon. And uh, thanks, Constantine, for uh, the great pitch. I loved, uh, especially the starting. It was very powerful, I think. Uh, the first question I have for you is, um, actually, why do you think um, a farmer should choose this product instead of any other product that is out there in the market? What makes your product like the best solution for them? Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you, Alberto. It's a pleasure to be here. So to directly answer your question, our approach is really to go full cycle. The uh, sargassum plague um, is also caused by, by over fertilization. And we also want to target this root cause basically um, by providing them the biostimulant, which is really an organic product and doesn't lead to this over fertilization. And uh, on the second hand, it's, it's a really cheap product because we can uh, get the, the algae for a really low price basically, by just removing it from the beach so to say, um, and it yeah helps to helps to increase the growth of their plants. Super interesting. Thank you. So while um, giving a product, you're also trying to solve the root cause uh, that's causing the same problem. Exactly. That's uh, very interesting. So this leads to my next question, actually. So what's the go-to-market strategy that you have in mind? How do you imagine to reach the the farmers? And you mentioned the farmers, um, only the local farmers, and I want to ask you also why only local farmers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we decided to start this project in the Dominican Republic because there are many um, organic farmers there, um, which is our um, target group, so to say. And we want to reach them, um, especially by using um, associations, farmer associations. All of the farmers are connected and yeah, we want to like get into this network and then, um, yeah, by word of mouth, mouth also, we think we can really, um, yeah, address these farmers and uh, convince them of our product. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Let me try it now if I have a good connection. Do you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah. Sound good. Sound good. Clear. I have a question. How do you promote? How do you promote yourself? And how you make clear to the farmer that your product is outstanding? It's different than all the other products, and this product will give them a good return of investment. How do you want to convince them? Mm -hmm. um, so we mainly want to um, go through social media and also WhatsApp. Uh, we learned that those are the main uh, communication channels, uh, ch channels in the Dominican Republic. And yeah, we want to convince them by showing them that our product actually works. And they, they have this, this problem also in mind. Um, it's, it's increasing uh, like every day, so to say, in the Dominican Republic. You see it on the beaches, the, the sargassum algae. 
And so they, they will know that our product is tackling this problem as well as help them with their plans. Thank you. Yeah, you have to really have answer my question, question in a way that um, do you have do you have clear financial numbers? Let's say, listen, you apply this, and these are the costs, and this is your benefit, short term and long term. Do you have that clear? Do you bring it in your marketing strategy? Exact numbers for um, what is our cost to reach one customer? That's what you want to know, or okay, so. Um, to be honest, I cannot give you. No, what are the costs per, per? How much he? How much he's returning? What's his? What's his return of investment ah. when he uses your product? How much does he get back from it? Ah, okay, okay. Now I get your question. Sorry. Um, yeah, that um, also depends on the crops. Um, and we are still in a research phase, so we cannot give you uh, exact numbers, and we don't want to make any wrong promises here. So we are currently researching it. We are um, co cooperating with universities on that. And I don't want to throw any numbers in here that might in the end not, not work out. Sure, thank you, Constantine. And thank you, members of the selection committee for that. A big thank you to the whole Sea Soy Lution team for participating in the innovation challenge. It's time for our next pitch. Next up, we have co-founder Yara Haydar pitching for Cloud Pads. Thank you so much for having me. Greetings everyone, I'm Yara from Cloud. Thousands of individuals from across the globe, just like us, want to change the world. But in fact, many are ignoring the elephant in the room, the period experience as we know it. We've normalized the mass production of sanitary pads despite the fact that it's been causing rash, allergies and infections and over 113,000 tons of non-recyclable waste. With 80% women favoring disposable pads over any other product, Cloud is a sanitary pad that is healthy, biodegradable, compostable, and sustainably produced using banana fibers. Now you may ask, why banana? The numbers are out there. There exist extensive areas of banana plantations in the MENA region that produce huge amounts of waste. Cloud sees opportunity. What the world sees as agro-waste, we see as a material that is healthy, absorbent, and hypoallergenic, and as such, we use it as the base material in our production. So simply put, Cloud is the first in the MENA region to do this. Now, Yaro, make it make sense. The process is as follows. We extract the banana fibers from banana tree trunks. We sandwich it with the top layer of organic cotton and the bottom layer of biodegradable plastic. We then sterilize them and decontaminate them. And right now we're taking it a step further by getting it health certified. Our market size in the MENA region is huge with a serviceable obtainable market of $1.7 billion. So far, Cloud has been able to achieve remarkable milestones. We have tested two prototypes, tested the market, and secured a total amount of $25,000 in equity-free seed funding. Cloud exists where Cloud is needed most. We fill the gap through individual subscription plans that are direct to consumer through online sales and in vending machines across schools, public bathrooms, and restaurants. A Cloud box is at a production cost of $2.05, and we offer it at a very competitive yet accessible price of $3.10. The longer you subscribe to cloud, the cheaper it gets and smoother your period experience is. These online revenue is added to a diverse revenue stream that feeds into our running costs and a digital marketing strategy. When it comes to competition in the MENA region, cloud is the only one that is three in one, healthy, eco-friendly and easily accessible. We are redesigning the period experience, not just through a product that is better for the environment and your body, but also through an online community for Arab women to share and learn and empower one another. This is all made possible thanks to a team of six motivated individuals, highly skilled in product design, business hacking, R&D, and agricultural engineering. Our ask today is mentorship and market connections, media visibility and marketing, and a $500,000 investment to achieve our projected milestones for the next 18 months. Thank you so much. We are very excited to get Cloud to your doorsteps. questions for the CloudPads team will be co-founder and CEO Sarah El Karuni. Damiano Pachuzzella and Frederick Schwerz will be asking questions on behalf of the committee. Let's begin with a question from Damiano. Oh, thank you, Damiano from, Siam, uh, from Siambari. Uh, my first question uh, is related to the, the competitor analysis. 
because you know that in this uh, in this field in the sanitary pads we have uh, many big companies at uh, at international level and uh, also this uh, this big company work respect of the um, ecological solution or uh, or use of non not uh, organic material and, uh, and other solution and uh, uh, my question is respect to if you evaluate this uh, this market and this uh, competitor yes first of all hello everyone and thank you for giving us the opportunity to participate in this event and thank you uh, for your question it's a very valid question um just to answer you briefly uh we do have uh, we did have look a look at the market and the competition when it comes to these big uh, companies, especially with uh, the in regards to the ecological aspect of it. Now, we do pride ourselves in having the unfair advantage of having access to bio, uh, biodegradable and organic materials that these companies uh, do not have access to by being located in the Middle East and already growing connections with farmers and manufacturers in the area. Uh, so it's about getting that advantage before uh, the rise of the sustainable market when it comes to these uh, biodegradable pads. Now, again, uh, when it comes to sustainability in the period uh, product market, uh, what people are looking for now are reusability. And what we're offering is disposability with biodegradability and compostability, which is a difference because it leads to less uh, behavioral change from the customers that we are um, actually offering this to and giving us a broader market uh, in the area and globally. Uh, so this is a little parenthesis that I want to open and uh, I hope that I answered your, your question. Uh, okay, thank you. The, the second question is respect to the um... To the, uh, to the banana, the banana trees, uh, because uh, you know that the, in, the, in the banana trees, in the banana leaves, uh, I don't know the, the, in, the, in, the, in general, uh, there are many pesticides. Uh, what do you think respect of this aspect, considering that we want to use this uh, in, uh, in sanitary pads? <laughs> Yes. Um, okay, so uh, it's a also very good question. And this is something that we have tested extensively at the beginning of our uh, prototyping stages to make sure that these pesticides that are uh, used in, pla in plant growing and farming are not uh, translated into the pad. And in the production process itself of extracting these fibers from, I have to specify, the trunk of the banana rather than the, than the leaves, uh, we go through several uh, uh, organic chemicals that dissolve and uh, remove this, uh, this risk of pesticides. And the banana fiber that we actually extract in itself is hypoallergenic. Uh, but again, to test this further, we are now on the stage of running a second trial with uh, cl clinical entities that are approved by ISO to further uh, test uh, our product when it comes to health and comfort and rashes and allergies, just to make uh, safety a better peace of mind for our customers. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I have a question in related with your two questions, actually, in related was well, first one is uh, in relation with scaling. In case you start getting, uh, how you call that, getting good demand, people pick it up, you solve your pesticide issue, which is all by demand and Damiano. Do we have a plan how much money you need to go quick to a larger scale? Uh, yes, so now we are talking for the first um, if we're talking for the first two years, we're asking for a uh, first ask of $500,000 for an 18 month uh, go to mar market st strategy in the Middle East and specifically launching in Dubai. Uh, and the return on investment on that ask is around uh, a half a million dollars with 150,000 women, which we aim to reach in our first year through social media advertising and a 
extensive digital marketing campaign. So that's the first 18 months. And then scalability beyond that will depend, of course, on demand and uh, how that demand impacts on our, on our production output. Thank you, Sarah, for that. And uh, unfortunately, I do have to interject as we have reached five minutes. Um, a big thank you to Sarah and the entire CloudPad team for joining us. Thank you so much. Our next everyone. innovation is Rural Farmers Hub Capture. The agricultural sector in Africa is plagued by persistently unpredictable and often low crop yields, which can be attributed to one, climate change. Global warming is impacting the biochemical behaviors of crops, the process through which it makes the food we eat, causing abnormal behaviors. Two, a widespread use of legacy farming practice. Farming decisions that are not backed by data exposes farmers to huge risks that leaves millions of them untouchable. Three, inadequate agricultural extension. During their interaction with smallholder farmers, extension workers are meant to bridge the knowledge gap in precision farming, response to climate change, and pest attacks. It is estimated that many African countries are only able to cover 6% of their farmers. To tackle this challenge, we use our proven technology and precision farming tool called Capture to guide farmers against farming risks leading to improved crop yields and income. Capture supports farmers remotely in watching and analyzing crop performances, visualizing soil nutrient maps with precise yield-based fertilizer recommendation, pre-planting insights on ecological advantages, timing optimization, and predictive analytics. By adding technology and efficiency to crop production, we are attracting more young people, especially women, into agri-services and farming, helping to create quality youth employment opportunities while bridging the age gap in the agricultural sector. Similarly, our solution accounts for changing climate conditions, reducing the need for farmers to expand into resource-stressed areas. The use of data-driven best practices also minimizes the utilization of resources such as water and fertilizer, thereby positively impacting the environment. Capture generates all these insights in near real time and personalized for each farmer, accessible through multiple channels, including SMS. Today, over 20,000 farmers use Capture, who, during the 2020 planting season, recorded an average of 55% increase in crop yields for maize, rice, and soybean, with a corresponding 33% rise in income. Our team is composed of professionals with relevant experiences in the science of business of agriculture. Now I know you are interested in some of the things we are doing at Rural Farmers Hub. You are welcome. Join us as we contribute to the transformation of our food system using a solution that pays for itself in the first season. Connect with us at ruralfarmershub.com. Welcome to the team representative from Rural Farmers Hub Capture, co-founder and COO, Gabriel Eze. Representing the committee to ask questions about this innovation will be Jacob Van Etten and Samuele Barales. To start, let's go to Jacob for our first question. Hey everyone, and hi Gabriel, nice to meet you in person. Um, your solution is, uh, is going to provide advice to farmers. Um, I, I would like to ask you to describe a little bit more how you obtain data to actually uh, provide uh, that kind of advice. Uh, so you're talking about plot level advice. Um, and maybe give us an example of, of, of one particular type of, of advice. So a variety recommendation or a fertilizer recommendation. How, how would it work uh, in terms of the data that you need to provide a, a really good recommendation? 
Okay, thank you very much um, for having me. Uh, so we get data from, from three sources. Uh, we can actually combine all three of them. The first one is satellite remote sensing. Uh, the second one is agronomic data from research institutes. And the third one is a climate data. Uh, so we combine them in, uh, together to be able to generate the advice. So it begins with pre planting decisions. Uh, so we can use, uh, and this is something in collaboration with a, a, a group of scientists in Netherlands who take in satellite and climate data to determine the pH level and the soil organic matter of the farm uh, so that the farmer can provide mitigation uh, before the planting actually happens. Uh, we use uh, nitrogen-based remote sensing to evaluate uh, soil nutrient product, soil productivity, essentially to measure where the deficiencies are and then recommend what kind of uh, addition needs to be added uh, so that the farmer does not overapply or undersupply uh, the soil in order to meet an expected uh, yield. So it, it's just uh, basically what we do, those three data sources. Okay, thanks a lot. My second question is about uh, uh, your market size and the types of farmers that you think you can um, reach. So are there any literacy requirements or farm size kind of requirements that you expect to be uh, in, in, in place for you to be able to, to reach a certain farmer? Is it, is it also for very small farms and um, illiterate farmers, so to say, where is there a certain segment in the market that you address first? Uh, can you describe that a little bit more, uh, please? Yeah, the market size in Africa is nearly 400 million farmers uh, who, matter of fact, produce over 60% of the food, over 70% of the food consumed across the continent. So it's a very huge number of farmers. And the average size of the farms are somewhere between uh, one to, to 10 hectares. And we have seen that this, this solution works better for 0 0.3 hectares and above. Uh, so farmers that are less than 0 0.3 hectares may not be able to benefit uh, mm -hmm. from, from the, the advisories available in local languages. Uh, so we have it in Hausa uh, and, and some other Nigerian languages. And matter of fact, there is also some sort of barriers in local language. So we have physical extension agents, over 100 of them, who in turn provide face-to-face -face advisory to the farmers uh, using the, this, this tool. Thanks. I think it's over to Samuel now. Yep. Thank you, Gabriel. I am Samuel from the Italian Institute of Technology. Thank you for your interesting presentation. I have just um, a couple of questions. The first one is about competitors. How do you position it yourself compared to a similar solution? And what is the competitive advantage you think your solution is providing to farmers? So I think uh, for our unique markets, most farmers are in remote villages and the farms are far apart. Uh, most existing competition are largely web-based and may not be interested in taking the huge risks associated with actually having like underground a unit for those things to happen. So we, we have, we are building a network of lead farmers who we have trained to become extension agents. They will serve as extension agents as well as, as sales or marketing people so that we have foot on the ground uh, until the internet uh, connectivity comes there. We are leveraging on this network of extension agents. That for me, it's our unique uh, advantage. Thank you for your answer. And the second one um, is about fundraising. Um, once you, you get the, the first money you're raising from the market uh, or from private or public investors, what will you do for the first uh, resources you, you gather? Unfortunately, I do have to interrupt as we have reached our five minute limit, but I do want to thank Gabriel and both members of our selection committee for your participation in this Q&A. Next up, we have the pitch from Ira Smart.
ladies and gentlemen, we, the Spectrum Research Team from the National School of Agriculture of Meknes, Morocco, are very glad to have been given the opportunity to introduce our innovation for smart water management here at the Agrobiodiversity Innovation Challenge. In the occasion of the COP26, Sir David Attenborough has stated, we are the greatest problem solvers to have ever existed. A strong call to adapt and improve our agricultural systems in which water management plays a vital role. The farmers know that, and all the time they ask themselves, how much, how long, and how often should I irrigate? A clear and precise answer to their daily needs is seldom provided by traditional knowledge, however. Erismart, the free smartphone application, now provides just that, a daily reliable irrigation schedule, saving time and resources to farmers, with potential to scale to local actors in the irrigation chain. Erismart was launched early 2021 in French and Arabic and immediately downloaded by more than 1,000 users. It serves scientists, extension services, farmers and advisors in agriculture alike. The app answers to daily water requirements in number and duration of irrigation. Once the users identify their parcel, climatic data are generated. They select crop, general soil features and irrigation system. Once done, they will now receive everyday precise irrigation instructions. Irismart is a free multilingual application, simple and easy to use, horizontally accessible through voice guidance for users enabled to read or see the screen, and SMS services when internet is not available. On top of that, it's scientifically accurate and ever adapting through constantly updated climatic data and does not require any equipment to be installed on site. The current version of Irismart is believed to be at technology readiness level 9. But our next objectives are to make a English version, extend the coverage to Africa and more crops and indoor crops, enhance the app with more functions such as salinity management, and develop an advanced version for professionals in the field. Winning the Agrobiodiversity Innovation Challenge would make it all possible, giving the chance to recognize young research team efforts, network with peers and institutions, partnering with CGR researchers for development, growth through mentoring on business model fine-tuning, larger outreach for more people to appreciate irismart in their own fields, sustainability long-term in covering operational needs. irismart is indeed a science-based solution, presenting large upscaling opportunities with fast implementation times and guarantees results in increasing productivity while saving resources. The app can catalyze CGR expertise on increasing crop resilience against climate change, reducing the energy footprint for pumping, saving water and protecting biodiversity, empowering gender equality, yet opportunities, and horizontal inclusion in agriculture, enhancing food security and improve livelihoods. This is our vision and the shared message. Thank you. Representative from Irismart, Professor and Innovation Author Aziz Abu Abdullah. Gladys Morales and Samuele Morales will be asking questions on behalf of the committee. Let's begin with a question from Gladys. Thank you so much, Megan, and thank you to the Iris Bar team. Um, how are you ensuring as you grow accessibility by small scale farmers to, uh, to the solution and uh, long-term affordability and sustainability? Oh, uh, thank you for your uh, question. First of all, um, to bring this um, this solution to the small to farmers uh, requires some uh, downscaling. So we do have, like in the, in the country, an organism for uh, advising. So uh, uh, advising agriculture. So while uh, using this, uh, they can scale it to the small farmers. But by the way, we are also using um, uh, social network and field farm school to invite farmers to see our uh, irrigation platform and how can we use the application. And also we use in uh, different languages so we can uh, promote the use of this uh, app. For, for the second part of your question for sustainability uh, of the app, for sure um, uh, we, uh, we are still working on other versions. Uh, other versions with customized uh, use uh, for medium and large growers and mainly also for uh, exporting growers and maybe it's going to be uh, a paid a paid uh, a paid application so we can uh, take into uh, consideration the charges that we use for uh, the sustainability of this uh, app okay i guess it's my Turn. Thank you for your presentation, Professor Aziz. Just a question on the team that you want to, uh, to involve in this, in the next action of your startup project. So 
what kind of other professionals you, you, you want to add to your team and if needed, who are they? Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, in general, if you want to develop new versions more customized, we need the physiologist and the agronomist. So because uh, the crops, um, you know, each crop has its, its own uh, physiology and different parameters we are using, and we need to customize it for specific type of climatic regions. If we, uh, uh, if we want to make a, a new application for Africa, we need to know the context of Africa, so we need more data. And for that, we need more uh, researchers to be involved, with mainly physiologic researcher and maybe also um, uh, climatic uh, people who are dealing with climatic uh, uh, data and so on. Okay, thank you. The next question is about, I saw a slide presenting the TRL of your innovation, of your solution. What's the next stage of TRL and what you need to, to reach them? Well, uh, we believe that our uh, first version, which is 1.0, is uh, reaching the number nine of the uh, which is reaching maturity since now it's in the market and it's for free and it's working and has been downloaded with more than 1,000 users a couple of days ago. Uh, after that, we launched it on uh, Google Play. Uh, but um, next step, um, we if we develop, we are we are working on new versions and uh, new languages and new versions and also customized one. So uh, it needs, for example, for us uh, one year or one year and a half to reach uh, the maturity. Uh, then uh, a couple of um, maybe another year after that it's it's been launched, it will be a self-funding uh, solution. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much again to the Iri team, uh, Iri Smart team. I would like to ask also, how do you think that your solution can promote the diverse farming systems? Uh, well, uh, you know, um, while while um, saving water, uh, the, or, or like giving information on uh, irrigation management, irrigation management will not be a limitation for uh, for growing more crops. So it helps on you know, agrobiodiversity. And by the way, our application. Uh, provide different, uh, a large list of uh, crops used in Morocco and also in other countries. And we are dealing also to add other more crops. So the farmer, if they don't have a limitation on information how to use the water, they can even think about using more crops and avoid making monocultures. So it will help on biodiversity, agrobiodiversity and uh, including uh, diversity, biodiversity of the agricultural systems, ecosystems. Thank you to the members of the committee and Aziz for that Q&A portion. We are very happy to have your participation in this event. Our next innovation pitch will come to us from Cool Mill. Imagine you are Lily, a smallholder rice farmer from rural Malawi who spends over six hours a day hand pounding her two tons of rice. Lily has no other options. She's excluded from the value chain post harvest as she can't afford to transport her paddy to be processed at the closest rice mill. Even the mechanised milling in use there is inefficient and damaging, which can result in up to 80% loss of rice from the entire production. Rice is an antiquated and wasteful $550 billion global industry that feeds 3.5 billion people daily. Millions of SMEs like Lily are locked into poor post-harvest drying, storage and processing. Each year, enough rice to feed 600 million people will not make it from farm to fork, wasting the finite resources deployed to grow the rice. The annual triple bottom line loss is $127 billion. Coolmill have developed a unique patented technology that is part of the solution to this problem, but we need your help to connect the solution to the people effectively and rapidly. Imagine how Lily and the other 1.4 million SME smallholders' lives would change if they had access to best-in-class rice processing technology. Coolmill, a UK-based SME currently working in the Punjab in Nigeria, is the only technology that can adapt the size of our machine to suit the individual needs of users without losing performance, run off-grid due to its ultra-low power requirements, 
offer access through our machinery as a service business model to all processors, empowering everyone to compete equally on price and quality, regardless of size, gender or location. Co-create additional value that is equitably distributed in a shortened and rebalanced value chain. Coolmill delivers more food from existing harvest with less loss, less power and less environmental impact. People like Lily are nervous and distrustful of new technology. Seagar can offer impartial validation, support outreach work such as Coolmill's milling schools to engage with end users to understand their needs and evolve a technical, economically viable solution meeting those needs. Currently, there is a lot of focus and support on improving rice pre-harvest. The value of that pre-harvest investment will be maximised by improving post-harvest processing. At a micro level with Coolmill technology, Lily and her kids are better fed, healthier and economically stable. At a macro level, her country no longer needs to import rice that is already grown and processed locally. With the help of Seagar, Coolmill's technology can change the GDP of countries. Thank you. Welcome to the team representative from Coolmill, project engineer and manager Penny Morton. Representing the committee to ask questions about this innovation will be Jacob Van Etten and Matthias Brinks-Lorenz. To start, let's go to Matthias for our first question. Hi, glad to be here today. I'm representing Rockstart. Um, you mentioned that you have a patented solution. Can you elaborate exactly what the patent covers and which claims you have uh, addressed? Yeah, so our milling chamber technology is patented um, and we have this covered in lots of different countries across the world and we just refreshed it. So I would need to check with the CEO exactly which countries we've got that in. But the, the point is, is the, uh, the way that the milling chambers work, it means that we can use that in a large scale machine, but then it means that we can downsize it and use it in a smaller machine with no um, impact on milling performance, which is something no other uh, milling machinery can do right now. Awesome, thanks a lot for clarifying. Maybe a short follow-up question here. Can you elaborate on the distribution model? How are you going to market today? So currently uh, we have a pilot mill in India, in Rajdhani, um, and the way that we've done that is we have worked uh, with milling schools. So in January, we worked with 20 uh, SME millers and they came to the um, work with the machine and they left, 100% of them left realising that this technology would improve their uh, profits and improve their livelihoods. So this is the same uh, procedure that we would do in Africa. We would have a, a pilot mill and then we build a milling cluster around it. So we would use machines based around that successful mill and then we would scale uh, going that way. We would then do multiple milling clusters across the country. But the way that we do that is we really need, um, we need to have a local partner on the ground, which is the way we've done it in India. We have Abhishek, our engineer, who's on the ground, understands the local culture, the economics and how the rice industry works in Recording that country. Recording stopped. Thanks. Great. I take on the next question. And then um, what I saw is that uh, you're planning to uh, um, charge as a revenue model at 20% of the uh, of the price uh, or the value of the rice that goes through the mills. Can you explain a little bit how that uh, revenue is then distributed um, in, in, uh, to, to the different uh, parties involved? So although, so at Coolmill, um, our technology is, is revolutionary and patented, but another thing we've been really working on is to be able to get our technology to the people who really need it most. And what we've been working on in the, the past years is a servitization model. So it's a, it's a pay-as-you mill machinery as a service. And this is something that we are looking to adapt and develop in the countries that we work in. So we need to really work collaboratively. We need to understand what the smallholders or the rural farmers are going right now. What are they getting back for the paddy that they're milling? And then 
from that, we can create additional value. We can mill what they have much better than the current machinery is because it works completely differently. But then also it's, it's looking forward. If we can process what they've got currently better, we can reach them into new markets and we can make we can market and, and package their what we're giving them completely differently than they, they currently are now if they're milling government rice um, and they're getting subsidized for paying that. It's a, it's a different approach and we can look really holistically at a whole solution from start to finish. Hey, let me ask a follow-up question. Uh, my next question is exactly about that. Um, in terms of bundling with other kind of things such as storage, et cetera, have you thought about that? Uh, partnerships, what, what um, can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Yes, um, partnership is very much at the heart of Cool Mill and we don't have all the answers to everything. There's other companies out there who are already doing amazing innovative storage technology solutions. So we really want to partner with those companies in country and create that holistic solution um, on the ground, um, which is yet something that we're looking into. And we already have partners around the world prepared to do that. So it's just about getting the, the right ones in the right place and joining everything up. Thank you. Can I join with a follow-up question to that? I mean, your partnering strategy seems like also a, a difficult way to scale. How do you think about that if you want to grow your business fast? Um, I think competitions like this are, are great for us because it really gives us um, a greater visibility to be able to partner with the, the key partners within that country. Um, yes, it's a maybe it's going to take us longer to scale, but I think the way that we'll, we'll scale will be a lot more effective and sustainable. We want our cool mill technology to still be there in 10 years. There, there's no point in us taking this amazing technology, putting it in country, and then two weeks later, they, they don't like it and they don't want to use it. So if we can collaborate with a company or or some a local partner on the ground who understands that, and it means that- Unfortunately, I do have to result. interrupt. <laughs> it's okay. We have reached the end of our five minutes, but thank you for those questions and answers. And thank, thank you to the entire Cool Mill team for your participation. Our next pitch comes to us from Nord Frey. I'm Lars Hedam, CEO of Neon Frey. Subsistence smallhold farmers in developing countries cannot get access to high yielding farming solutions. On their own, they can't get access to lending. Their land parcels are too small for large scale mechanization. They have basic and limited agricultural education and they have little to no access to markets. What Neon Frey delivers are advanced aquaponic farming solutions with a farmer monitoring sensor service so that the farmers can always operate the farms with maximum efficiency. Through our equitable business plan and outgrow model, we facilitate access to finance, train farmers, delivers 24 seven monitoring services and create access to high paying markets for the farmers. The market share represented by the smallholder farmers in developing countries is huge, but have largely been overlooked by the seasoned agribusinesses. And this is due to the lack of adequate business models and technology implementation. Business model fails on selling costly, yield improving technology directly to the farmer, but without proper support. And technology applications throughout the sector relies on and fails on the proficiency of the farmers. We've created a low tech front end and high tech back end solution. This merges the possibility of using the very best sensor and AI tech currently out there, whilst only letting the farmers pay for and use the on-farm augmentation service. Our solution works because we are building it from the needs and shortcomings of the subsistence model farmer. We are currently looking to raise about $70,000 over the next six months to fully build out and operate our MVP. As the current system relies on biology through the plants and the fish, we need to buy ourselves more time to see the results. And the GGI AR award will allow us to extend this test period on the MVP, as well as installing new um, media grow bits in our systems. With a couple of more months of running the MVP, it will give us valuable data points, which can verify our tech and business model. 
And we hope that the CGIAR can help scale and promote Nonfray as well as aquaponics as a means to alleviate poverty, increase employment for women in agriculture, bring nutritious food to market, reduce agriculture waste, and preserve the local biodiversity. Our model promotes ownership, confidence, and wealth at the farmer level, season after season, and year after year. Thank you. Founder and CEO Lars Hededam joins us today to represent Nord Frey. Samuele Morales and Alberto Mitti will represent the committee to ask questions. Let's begin with a question from Samuele. Hey Lars, thank you for your interesting presentation. I have a question on the technology that uh, is behind your solution. If you could give us some more details about um, the enabling technology. Yeah, sure. Thank you for having me. So the technology of aquaponics is globally proven, both in, in terms of academia, but also commercially. And um, the added value we kind of put on is uh, the sensory system. And the sensory system is combined with um, very rudimentary sis, uh, sensors, which measure water quality. So that's the pH uh, control and so on. And there's some more, um, uh, some, some a bit more advanced system that we're developing with a couple of universities. The technology is that we have these sensors, they relay information back to a central point where very skilled people can, can kind of analyze the data and then contact the farmers directly, um, being that on, on phone or in, in person or meeting up on the farms. Okay, thank you. And if you could just um, be a little bit more specific on your business model that was well depicted in the this slide, but you didn't have enough time probably to, to expand it. Yeah, so the business model is taking um, well, basically taking 40 farmers and putting them together in a, in a cooperative. The cooperatives are very uh, normal throughout Rwanda. Um, and with these 40 people, uh, we will get the access to finance through commercial banks, development banks, development agencies to buy one hectare of land outside of their own plots and then install our full aquaponic system. So that's fish uh, tanks, it's uh, pipes, it's pumps and grow beds, of course. And then on top of that is our, our system. So we train the farmers for the first two years uh, in, in this and operate very closely with them. And after that, we let go. And within four years time, the farmers will have repaid the whole system. Uh, and at this point, there's a, a kind of a, an ownership flip where the farmers become the majority owner and we retain a minority ownership. And that makes us the possibility of keeping the capital costs very low, um, but still covering our overhead cost and delivering a continued service uh, just, you know, not just selling and running away, but actually following the farmers throughout these, this process of, of, um, of growing. Thank you. Yeah, building on the, the question of Samuel, actually, I have a question related to um, the business model too. Like, I, it's not super clear to me, how do you plan to uh, guarantee the sustainability of uh, the overall system uh, on the long term? Can you please elaborate a little bit more on that? So in sustainability, you mean- the financial sustainability. The financial sustainability, yeah, sure. So uh, the way we, we put it together is, is uh, as a kind of an inverse dependency model where we are dependent on the farmers doing well. So we would be pushing to get them up to, first of all, up to the level where they can run the standard operating procedures, but run the, the system quite confidently. And then our technology, the monitoring system kind of fills that gap up to up to the, the optimization that we are, are trying to get. Um, the longevity of it, well, as a longevity of any, any pro uh, project, and, and uh, sorry, sustainability of any project, um, but that's the constant communication back and forth with the sensor system, the more data we accumulate, we'll be able to do um, a bit of machine learning on it and do uh, early uh, warning signs, and that's an early warning system. And that's kind of where we want to get to with the increased complexity of, of our, our sensor system is getting to that very, very extreme early warning system. Um, and there's no way of guaranteeing, you know, it's 100% uh, um, you know, optimal production at all time, but we will get as close as possible by following the farmers on the journey. Um, there's also the incentive for us because we're creating an economy, we are raising the, the farmer income, uh, the, the individual farmer income tenfold. And that means that, that, you know, not only are they getting more money, but they're also getting, getting equity, which they haven't had before, and they can lend against that, but they, we can also give them or, or supply them with, with new 
uh, product increasing products after the fact, both on the farm, but also uh, post harvest canning facilities, drying facilities, cold rooms, and so on. Mm. Okay, thanks. So, very quick last question. Um, how do you see your solution supporting agrobiodiversity? So, we see, see supporting agrobiodiversity on multiple reasons. So, first of all, it's got a very small uh, footprint, uh, only one hectare, and, and the, the, the intensity of crop production is quite high. We also have a, a variety of crops on, on each farm, and that's because we can aggregate between different farms to meet the demands of, of suppliers, of wholesalers, of exporters. Um, the system is also inherently very low on, on pesticides and herbicides, because if you put pesticides on the plants, you basically kill the fish, and we're trying to avoid that. And these early warning signs should also help seeing the threats coming before they are actually manifesting. So if there's something that needs to be done, we can act uh, fast and early. Thank Thanks. you for ending on that note for us, Lars. And thank you to the Nord Frey team for joining us today. Next up, we have a pitch for the hook and delivery HND system. Isabella Fiorello, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher from the BioInspire Soft Robotics Laboratory of the Italian Institute of Technology. I'm from Italy, and I'm one of the inventors of HND, a hook and delivery system to treat and preserve agrobiodiversity. Standard methods in agriculture make typical use of spray to deliver agrochemicals to plants. However, this technology suffers from high material loss and low efficiency due to the presence of plant barrier tissue, increasing the pollution and disturbing the biodiversity. To solve these issues, we proposed the first smart patch for plant leaves for in-situ delivery of plant treatments. Our innovation consists of a miniaturized device with arrays of bio-inspired micro-hooks, which are inspired from nature, from the natural anchoring structures of climbing plants. Similarly to the natural hooks, our artificial micro hooks can strongly anchor the leaf surfaces in shear directions. Our innovation can not only anchor, but also penetrate the leaf and access to the plant vascular tissue. When the hook is inside the leaf, it can dissolve inside it and can be used to release small molecules or micro nanoparticles. Why our solution? First of all, it is ecological and can be used in natural ecosystem. It provides the strongest anchoring forces to plant leaves. It is made with very low-cost materials and high scalable production processes, used to release many different plant treatments or to genetically modify the plants. Also, it can be used in combination with electronics for leaf sensing applications. Our solution has a global billion market, including smart farming, pesticide industry, precision forestry, but not only, because our market includes also plant biotechnology and research, and a new market called Precision Plant Medicine. We are a strong and multidisciplinary team from the BioInspired Soft Robotics Laboratory of IT, led from the director, Barbara Mansulay. We have different skills, ranging from biology to engineer. We are full-time researchers, and we have prototypes, publications, and a pending patent about these innovations. What we need is to do a jump from what remains science and what can become a product that can be used in the real world and go to the market. We hope that this challenge will give us the tools to transform our research into a product. We are interested in all prize and benefits offered from the competition, especially in cash prize, partnership, acceleration programs and investments. Our innovation can be used also in fragile states as a smart tool for reducing the use of water and pesticide consumption and to enhance the food productions. We think that the guidance from a global agricultural research partnership can help us to start the path for scaling up our innovation. Thank you for listening. We hope that you will invest in us and in our research. Welcome to the team representative from HND Hook and Delivery System. Founder Isabella Fiorello. Representing the committee to ask questions about this innovation will be Damiano Pezzuzzella and Frederick Schwerz. To start, let's go to Damiano for our first question. Hi, Isabella. Um, 
from an ecological point of view, it's, uh, it's very interesting, your, uh, your, uh, your innovative solution. But uh, my question is related to the, to if you, have you evaluated the, the labor costs to, to apply your solution uh, mainly in, uh, in the big farm, for example, because I, I think that is very expensive. You evaluate this aspect. Yes, actually, thank you so much for your question. Um, our solution in real is really cheap. Actually, we use a sugar uh, alcohol material, which is isomalt, which uh, costs about 10 euro for one kilogram. And each patch that we use it is 0 0.2 grams. So actually, we can produce 5,000 patches just with a uh, uh, few euros of the raw materials. Of course, then there are much more costs related to the pesticides and other kind of material that we have to inject inside the plants. But our patch is really low cost and is also scalable because we made it with a molding process. So the, I mean, the main issue is to do the mold, but when we have the mold, we can cast a thousand of patches at the same time. Yeah. Uh Yes, I, I, my, my question is related to the labor cost to, to, to put this solution, this uh, innovative solution for, for, each, uh, for each plant. Yes, Not actually also this, uh, usually also in uh, agricultural fields, and now we can see also robots that uh, spray agrochemicals uh, uh, to plants. Uh, we can also envision these robots with a ad hoc built manipulator that can attach this patch to each plant. Actually, I'm from a robotics lab, and uh, this could be feasible. It's not, uh, of course, need uh, here to do, but I think it's feasible in the future to imagine these robots in the field uh, attaching these patches to the leaves of the plants. Okay. And uh, the second question is related to the, the market analysis, the competitor analysis, because you know, for example, in Italy, we have uh, 100 uh, companies that work in this, uh, in this sector, we have uh, 1,000 uh, uh, different models, and uh, this company work, working in this moment, working to reduce uh, pollution, to reduce, uh, uh, to reduce the, 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 see, yes, the pollution of the farm. And uh, you, you evaluate this, uh, this, uh, this situation on the market uh, respect of your competitor for, for, or for the future competitor. Actually, maybe our main competitors can be considered also the manufacturing industries of spray, because the other industries, for example, pesticide industry, can also think to buy our device to use instead of spray. So, for example, can use this patch to inject more precisely the drug inside the plants, and also is more efficient because when you spray, we have also problem of the adherence uh, to the leaf cuticle and also to the assets inside the plant vascular tissue. Said so in our case, uh, um, the prototype is more efficient and also low cost and can be also applied to different markets. Okay, thanks. Isabella, I have a short question to you. It's yeah. actually quite simple. How do you make sure that other people are not copying your idea? <laughs> this actually, I don't know, but we patented it. So I hope other people cannot copy us. We have a patent pending, which is in co-titularity between IT and the Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna, which I do my PhD. So we hope that uh, cannot be copied. Actually, we are the first doing okay. this for the market, so. Okay, and then in case it cannot be copied, do you have a plan how you going to, uh, how you call that, uh, commercialize your IP? Because once you need to larger scale, you need mm -hmm. to have different uh, production facilities. And then uh, you must make sure that your, your IP, again, go back to the copy, that it stays protected, that it stays with you. You have any thoughts about that? Actually, we have for now only a general view of this because we are still at TRL free. So we have prototypes that work well in the lab for a proof of concept release of small molecules of fluorescein inside the plant vascular tissue of Betis leaves. And we are moving to TRL4, in which we aim to actually apply our device to treat some common disease. 
And in this phase, uh, maybe we need to also target a specific disease also based on the market needs and to do a patch that can be used for that specific disease. Thank so, you, Isabella. I will have to cut you off there because our time is up. But a big thank you to the entire HND system team for joining us today. Thank you so much. Next up, we have a pitch from Switch On Foundation. Good afternoon. Greetings from Switch On Foundation. More than a decade ago, when Switch On started working in Nadia district of West Bengal, India, they faced two systematic issues inadequate knowledge of organic production practices and absence of markets and marketing channels to sell organic produce. Thus, to enhance knowledge and practice, a series of interventions were planned with farmers. By facilitating a training on the preparation of organic fertilizers and pesticides, the farmers were made self sufficient and created a zero waste farm production model. 90% farmers now make their own organic inputs, reducing their total input cost by 50 to 70%. In order to address the market gap, SwitchOn collaborated with National Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development, NABAT, to establish On Farm Fresh Innovation Producer Company Limited in 2016, which is a farmer collective for developing agribusiness activities and enhancing farmer incomes. SwitchOn has conceptualized, initiated, and incubated organic foods to ease out marketing of organic products, providing post-harvest processing and premium prices of organic producers. Contract farming of organic crops has removed the transportation charges, that is almost 10% of the total costs, and processing and storage costs, which accounts for 20 to 30% of the total cost. SwitchOn has helped over 350 farmers of on-farm by linking them to various government schemes and facilitated seed procurement license from the state seed certification department. Farmers have reported a 10 to 25% increase in income by shift to organic agriculture. There has been significant socio-economic upliftment with income enhancement leading to improved rural infrastructure, enhanced rural mobility, farm mechanization and overall betterment of quality of life. Organic farming has improved soil health, water availability and overall growing condition of crops. There is an ever-increasing demand for organic products that need to be met by steady supply chains and therefore we understand there is a need to replicate this ecosystem across geographies. SwitchOn is currently incubating 30 more such farmer producer companies or FPCs across six states of India, namely Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, Meghalaya, Manipur, Sikkim and West Bengal. Through the Agro-Biodiversity Innovation Challenge, SwitchOn is looking for both funding as well as partnership opportunities. Being a not-for-profit organization, funding opportunities to awards, grants, and corporate funding initiatives are essential for us. Also, partnership in terms of networking, knowledge sharing, capacity building, and collaboration are necessary for on-ground implementation. We stand by our vision of promoting sustainable livelihoods and addressing environmental challenges through innovative business models and technologies to achieve our goal to create opportunities for 10 million undeserved people by 2030. Joining us today from the Switch On Foundation team is Project Manager of the Environment Conservation Society, Avro Basu. Representing the committee to ask questions about this innovation will be Gladys Morales and Jacob Bennett. Let's begin with a question from Gladys. Thank you so much, Megan, and thank you to the team from the Switch On Foundation. So my first question has to do with um, your um, um, the market. So what percentage of the market do you plan to get over in, in what period of time? So the market is currently increasing for the organic products. So we the current, <coughs> excuse me. The current market for organic products in West Bengal and in India is approximately um, more than 100 million. And what we are looking forward is to take up us in small clusters, not just in uh, we are working in different side, different groups in different parts of this um, in the country, and thereafter we can actually want to take it up in uh, in those high in those small small silos, and attract at least uh, about a million in each of these through each of these groups. 
Okay, uh, so in order to achieve that, what are your plans to scale up your team in the next uh, 12 months? Okay, so we have currently the operational teams in various parts of the country uh, where we are establishing these organizations. And uh, we do have agronomists who are working with us in planning the different uh, uh, package of practices which they can follow. We have economists which are, who are working with us who are um, currently leading the different market linkages, the scheme linkages, and we do have a huge operations team, as I said, who are helping in the uh, expansion on the ground. Okay, Jacob, do you want to go next? And yeah, thanks, Gladys. Hi, Avro. Um, nice to meet you in person. In terms of the, so we know organic market in, uh, in India is growing. Uh, what do you think are the prospects for the next few years? Will that growth uh, sustain and, and will the, the kind of price difference that you right, uh, have right now, will that sustain? Because that will be very essential to your business model. Yes, absolutely. That is something which is uh, an important part here. Uh, so currently the prices of organic products uh, compared to the inorganic products of the same uh, variety, the same species is generally 25 to 50% higher. And the more the branding goes, the higher the prices at times go. So that, that trend is currently increasing. And uh, we just hope that that 25% uh, higher price will be maintained. So that the farmers also see that feel the, um, get the, necessary impetus to actually invest in organic. And since we know uh, as a matter of fact, which is seen in India that the production actually goes down when they shift from inorganic to organic products. So giving that, uh, giving them the um, incentive of price, higher price gives them a huge, uh, in, that incentive. However, uh, the market here, as I said, uh, with Gla Gladys's question, it's been increasing and the post, uh, coronavirus period, it has even had a, a huge boost considering people are just shifting to organic products because they think it's much more healthier and it is to a certain extent. Um, so what if, what if this, uh, this increase doesn't sustain, right? What is your plan B if, if it doesn't happen? If the, if the prices drop, if there's market saturation, you're not the only one going into this area, uh, I know for sure. So what, do you have a scenario for, for that? So we are not an organization who have patented our innovation. This is not a technological innovation. For us, it's an innovation of concept. So this is something which we want to scale up in a, um, on various in various parts. And organic is something which has been currently promoted by the government of India. So we, ha we ha hardly have that thing in mind right now that it is going to be decreasing in the next, uh, say, 20, 30 years. And considering India's commitments to the sustainable development goals and sustainable food systems, uh, that is something which is unlikely. Uh, however, if you say that this is to be considered, um, then we do have diversification in certain cases. So for example, the farmer group need not always uh, work in for organic products. They can actually do a lot of other agribusiness activities as well. For example, food processing, they can work in food uh, um, for fertilizer input procurement and all these other things, which gives them a kind of higher income in certain other places as well. Thank you for those final notes, Avro. And thank you to the entire Switch On Foundation team for joining us. Next up, we have the pitch from No Feed. everyone. My name is Diana Rembe. I'm the founder and CEO of NoFeed and professionally I'm a microbiologist. At NoFeed we use science as a tool to help the aquaculture industry to grow sustainably. Aquaculture provides more than half of the global seafood and it's just booming. Unfortunately, the most important aquafeed ingredients such as fish meal and fish oil are experiencing a supply chain bottleneck. Aquafeed business relies on more than 400 million small fish to be 
captured and ground up into a protein base called the fish meal and fish oil, which is then blended with other grains to make a complete feed for the farmed fish. Trust me, this is not a long-term solution. This act is already threatening the life of the larger fish, larger species such as dolphins, whales, salmon, and tuna, which eat this little fish. And you know what? If the fish at the center of the ocean food chain disappears, so will the life that depends on them. And in addition to that, Fish meal has already filled the majority of the fish farmers. It has nutritional inconsistency. It is seasonal available, very expensive, and contains a lot of contamination. And this is the reason why no feed we engineered a completely new source of protein for the aquaculture industry. We use the readily available organic waste and we turn it into a protein. What we do, we collect the waste that would otherwise go to the dump site. We add a consortium of bacteria. We put these two inputs into our proprietary biology and equipment system, and through the bacteria fermentation process, we end up with a really high performance protein ingredient for feed, notably aquaculture, and we harvest a byproduct of organic liquid biofertilizer. So our product is a microbial marine free protein, uh, and it has exactly 71% of our dry weight protein and other important and valuable micronutrients. This is an NGMO product, which is very sustainable and can be scaled anywhere on the planet. Above all, it's patentable. We commenced the R&D in 2017, and we have already proved the concept. We are on phase two of commercialization and signing the contract. So, Today, we are raising 200,000 US dollars to be able to commercialize NoFeed, but winning the prize will help us to support our proof point to scale. We're also looking for a partnership from, with the protein and feed specialist, as well as the researchers. So our big business model is a B2B where we sell our product to the animal feed manufacturers for 1,000 US dollars per ton, giving us 30% of a profit margin. We have an amazing team ranging from R&D to the product development, and together we reimagine the future of aquaculture. We have different partners who are supporting us at different capacity. And as always, if fish will feed the world, we know feed, we are ready to feed the fish. Thank you so much. NoFeed founder and CEO Diana Orembe. Representing the committee to ask questions about this innovation will be Alberto Mitti and Matthias Brink Lorenz. To start, let's go to Alberto for our first question. Thank you, Megan, and thanks, uh, Diana. Um, so, the first question that comes to my mind is uh, what's your plan for distribution? How are you imagining to reach all the different uh, farmers and the different people you want to buy this product and to distribute this product then? Thank you so much, Alberto. So the model that we are using is a B2B, as I mentioned. We are selling our protein to the animal feed manufacturers. They use it to sell our final product and distribute to the fish farmers. And the reason why we choose the animal feed manufacturers is because they have the profession on producing the complete final product, but also they have the equipment and machineries on place and they have the customer base, the fish farmers already trusted them. Okay, thanks. Very straight to the point. Matthias, do you wanna you wanna go with your question? Then maybe we can jump back here. Yeah, for sure. I would love to understand sort of the technology behind here. So you say it's a bacteria-based process, and it's also non-GMO and it's patentable. How do those three things go together? Thank you so much, Matthias. So, you know, the bacteria are microscopic organisms. You can see them with your naked eyes, but we know feel we have managed to cultivate these microbes on the laboratory and we didn't end up on that we cultivate we find out this the bacteria that can work in a symbiotic relationship and degrade the waste use it as a source of carbon and energy as they grow into a bigger protein biomass so it's patentable because it's a patent pending and we are patenting four areas of our business. First is the consortium of bacteria that can degrade the organic waste and produce protein to replace soybean and fish meal in aquafeed production. And the second is the technology to make the nutrient on food waste available to be degraded by these bacteria. And the third one is the equipment that we're using is just not a normal fermenter. And the fourth one is a I mean, it's the technology to preserve these bacteria, making them inactive when outside the waste and active when applied on the organic waste. 
Clear, a straight to the point again, thank. Can I just call, uh, ask a follow-up question? So the growth efficacy on your feed uh, product relative to uh, sort of conventional product, if you will, or other sort of plant-based uh, fish proteins, how do you compare or have you done testing in that area? So thank you so much, Matthias, again. So during the R&D phase, we did an on-farm trial to compare our product uh, versus the alternative, which is fish meal and soybean meal. And our product proved that it can, the fish grow 40% faster, more than the, our counterparts. The survival rate was 97% on the fish that was fed with the no, with the no feed product. But also our product has a 70% of a protein profile compared to the counterpart, which has 45% and 43%. But also it's 30% uh, cheaper compared to the alternative. But also this is an eco-friendly product that we use the organic waste to farm it. In every one ton of the no feed product that we produce, four tons of organic waste is recycled and 7.76 tons of carbon dioxide is saved. Thanks. Thank you. Amazing. It's amazing because you answer many of the questions I had in mind. So I have to think about new questions. So one thing that coming to my mind now is you mentioned you made uh, trials with farmers. So how was the reaction with, uh, of the farmers when you uh, went uh, with your products? And how much is the value proposition you're proposing important for the farmers, apart from the increase of the, um, of the productivity? So the whole value proposition. Okay, thank you so much, Alberto, again. So we didn't start by producing the product. We started on the market to identify the problems that the farmers are facing. And the, I mean, I mean the feed, pro the protein problem was mentioned as much as the second problem, which was the fingerling problem. And we, we, that's why we decided to come up with the alternative protein to help these farmers. And when we're producing this protein, we didn't only consider a product that's going to be cheap or eco-friendly. We, we considered a product that can produce a health fish. So the fact that fish farmers are producing a health fish and they are reducing their, they, I mean, they're increasing the survival rate of their fish by 97% make it stand out. But at, on top of that, they are increasing their profitability by 30%. That's what make them admire our our product much and I did I forget to mention that in every one ton of our product produced we are saving three tons of fish meal that was that was supposed to be removed from the oceans for aqua feed production a great end to our Q&A session thank you Diana and thank you to the no feed team for joining us today thank you our final pitch comes to us from Sabex Hi, my name is David Appenda and I lead the Sabex team. The problems surrounding Africa's agriculture are multifaceted, from a lack of um, raw materials to um, fragmented supply chains to price volatility and then lack of standardization for agro commodities. Um, our platform is a real time agro commodities trading platform um, built on blockchain to facilitate buying and selling of grains and also to support warehouse receipt financing. Um, our approach is um, two models. The first is that we'll connect buyers and sellers of grains on the trading beat. And the second is to create a wealth receipt model where farmers can pledge or owners of commodities on the platform can pledge their commodities as collateral to obtain instant financing from the platform. So service provides an ecosystem linking directly buyers and sellers and financiers of agro commodities. Um, so why Sabex? Um, Sabex supports decentralized trading where buyers and sellers can negotiate prices, electronic wealth receipts, uh, like I mentioned earlier, there's a market opportunity where farmers can get competitive prices and then this issue of security of assets and an investment opportunity. The um, facility on the platform, the wealth receipt facility is broken down into 5 million, 20 million, 100 million. Farmers can assess this by playing their commodity. So the beauty about this is that we tell farmers you do not need to sell at um, horrible prices. If you, you mustn't sell at those prices, you can assess funding by pledging commodities as collateral and sell only when the price is right. We believe this will bring increased income to the farmers. So if you look at the platform, very simple to use. If you go to the homepage of www.sabex.ng, you can register 
very quickly, you know, and you get email verification on the platform. Afterwards, you log in with your email address and password. You create your wallet. The wallet is essentially what allows money into and out of the account. So if you are buying, you need to fund your wallet to buy. If you are selling, money common, you are when you are paid on the platform, money comes into your wallet. Now, as a seller on the platform, after you have sent your commodities for, after, if you want to have commodities, you take it to the warehouse, they are graded and um, uploaded. You go to um, your, the platform and then put it in the marketplace. So this is a marketplace where people can see the commodity, they see the quality, they see the grade, they see the location, and they can place an offer to buy or sell. This is how to enlist your commodities on the platform, where you put the volume and the quantity on the platform. So you can place your offer um, as the case may be. And then the loan model, like I mentioned earlier, allows you to take instant financing by collateralizing your commodity. Uh, so you essentially do a credit check on the platform, and then you select the commodity you have placed as collateral and the funds is disbursed into your account. Uh, over the past nine months, we've done over $340,000 in terms of transaction volume and we've done over um, 200,000 um, 200, metric tons and we hope to do over 10,000 metric tons in the next um, six to 12 months. Thank you. Welcome to the team representative from Sabex, lead and product manager, David Appenda. Representing the community to ask questions about this innovation will be Gladys Morales and Matthias Brink Lorenz. Let's begin with a question from Matthias. Hey, David. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I mean, sort of a trading platform as such is not uh, super unique, but I guess one of your USPs is that you also grant credit to the buyers in the platform uh, using their purchases or, or the crops as um, collateral. But that makes you closer almost to uh, a fintech in the sense that you're providing credits. You are already operating in thin margin business with, with a trading platform, and so is a credit granting. How do you ensure you don't take credit losses that sort of wipe out your profits from the trading business? Thank you very much for your question. I'm happy to be given this opportunity. Um, so the, the platform essentially runs on two formats. The first is the trading business where we connect buyers and sellers of commodities. So from that, we're already making margins by connecting buyers and sellers. We're already making, we make a margin for every supply we make. Now on the other side, which is the lending side, we 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 are we support or call where to sit financing. Wherever whatever the commodity that have been given to us, we can use that as collateral. So it's almost a zero chance of getting any losses because unless the commodities are there, we are not giving out any credit. So at every point in time, we have almost a hundred percent cover, and we give credit to the tune of seventy percent. So if we have commodity worth 100 million, we give you as high as 70 million. So that 30% is for a, a, a discrepancy in, in terms of pricing. So at almost every point, there will be no loss. We try to cover our commodities with, um, with the adequate collateral. What is your current credit losses? In so far, okay, so far we have a banking partner, Sterling Bank. Sterling Bank on the right, uh, our credit. So we are the platform and Stanley Bank is the financial provider. Um, so far, we've not gotten any credit losses as we speak because all commodities are collateralized. So in the event of um, inability of people to pay, we'll sell those commodities and pay back the loan. Thanks. Thank you. May I go, Megan? Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, David, and thank you to the Savix team. Um, I would like to follow on, on on Matthias' question about the default rate and uh, about um, even though you have collateral, in a, to be able to scale up your solution, you would be able you you would need to work in different constituencies, right? And we know uh, from microfinance that not everything is about collateral and not everything is about technology. You also need to develop relationships with the farmers. You need to develop those relationships with the communities and you need to know your clients. So how are you ensuring that, uh, that those relationships are being built? Thank you very much for your question. We work with um, pharma groups, who are called Sabex representative. The Sabex representatives work across the country in Nigeria they work in various community groups. Here we do KYC, we know your customer. We're able to work in farmers. The farmers do cross guarantees among themselves. So every farmer grant cross guarantees the other farmer. It helps us to build information about these farmers. And we use that transaction history and record. So we observe these farmers' behavior over time. They feel psychometric tests and all those things for us to know their behavioral tendency before we begin to avail them credit. So yes, we do our basic information, our basic knowledge, and then 
in terms of credit guarantee, we work with other institutions like impact guarantee and other local guarantee schemes to help us underwrite credit in case there are losses. But as we speak so far, we have not incurred losses, but we know as we scale up, we need to bring credit guarantee and insurance scheme into the game to help us cover for losses. Thank you, David. Um, the other question that I have has to do with uh, designing with the user. Uh, when you know when when you were showing the the mobile app, it requires a certain level of financial literacy and in um, you know other skills. Are you ensuring that you're actually targeting uh, rural and small scale farmers, given the difficulties that uh, they might have understanding an application like yours? Thank you very much. We empower our agents. Our agents go out to the field to help onboard these farmers on our behalf. We call them service representatives. They go there, work in the farming communities, use the farmers' local dialects and languages to help onboard these farmers. So we help these farmers, we give them first level support using Sabex agents that work in those villages. And then we use our financial inclusion tool to make sure that these farmers are adequately onboarded on the platform. So there's always a first level support we give these farmers in their local languages as well. Thank you, David. That takes us to the end of our five minutes for the Q&A. And for all watching, that was our last finalist pitch of the Innovation Challenge event today. Thank you to all 10 finalists for your hard work in putting together your pitches. Thank you to the members of the selection committee for your thoughtful questions. And of course, a big thank you to all participating virtually. The selection committee will now convene privately to deliberate and determine awards. So stick around for the award ceremony and closing remarks to hear who will be receiving which awards. Events like this are helping to bridge existing gaps in technical knowledge, commercial know-how, and human networks to create high-impact science-based technologies, solutions, and enterprises. Together, we can achieve our goal for all types of actors, like the participants today, innovators, scientists, funders, private sector actors, and entrepreneurs to work in concert with one another and to leverage each other's strengths. While this goes on, we encourage you to take part in the next event of the innovation space, the Agri-Food Tech Innovation Forum, beginning soon. Thank you all, and please keep connecting to take full advantage of this opportunity.